it's good to be with you all. Good morning. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks to Iman for putting this together, first of all, and appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, it's too bad we're not out in the field standing next to some cotton looking at stuff, but hopefully what I've got here for you today will be a benefit. I've got some pictures we had hoped to get in yesterday to shoot some video footage. We were harvesting a variety trial out in Coolidge, we basically just run out of hours in the day. So we weren't able to get the video footage, but I've got some, hopefully some good pictures that will illustrate what we're looking at. Uh, what I wanna to discuss today is some of the work that we're doing looking at the effects of heat stress on cotton production in the low deserts of Arizona. And this year, as, as you all know very well, has been a very good year for looking at uh, heat stress. Uh, it's the year of the never ending summer. Um, we've got several people that are helping us with this work, Blaze Ivanko, uh, with uh, Cooperative Extension, and I've got a couple of my technicians, Naomi Pear also, Pear also working with us. Um, also, I want to mention Karen Geldmacher with uh, Maricot Next Gen. She's been a, a, a collaborator in some of this work, and she's doing a lot of this work on their own varieties, similar to what we're doing with, with uh, the evaluations that we're doing in our, in our trials. And she's been a valuable resource as we bounce ideas off each other. So uh, one thing before I get into this, I do want to mention, Iman and I have been discussing uh, putting together a virtual field day for the trial that we have out at Rainers. We do this every year, uh, one of our university variety trials. We are planning to do a virtual field day. Uh, we don't know exactly when it will be yet, sometime in November, probably going to be after Thanksgiving so that we get the, the field prepped and, and ready for harvest. So there's, there's more to see, but there will be details forthcoming about that soon. And we'll let you know when the day is and it will be virtual. Uh, it will be a live broadcast is what we're planning. So anyway, more details about that coming. All right, so just a little bit of background as you all well know, cotton production in Arizona is characterized by a very hot, dry climate have very high yield potential, very relatively low disease pressure. Uh, and because of that, we've seen a lot of companies come into the state for using Arizona and our production areas for producing new uh, seed for new varieties, seed production. In fact, a pretty significant portion of our cotton acreage in Arizona is under uh, some sort of seed production contract. Uh, but what we've noticed is some of these varieties that come into the state have not been tested uh, all that much in Arizona. And we see, we've noticed that uh, some disruptions in fruiting patterns, issues with uh, uh, bowl, small bowl abortion, uh, pollination issues, um, and we can correlate those to level two heat stress events. So what we wanted to do was to begin to develop some in-field assessments that we could use to assess the heat tolerance of a particular variety when it comes in. And a lot of this work has been done over the years. Uh, Paul Brown, who recently retired with the U of A, did a lot of this work back in the mid 80s or mid 90s, excuse me, uh, looking at the effects of, of heat stress. And several things were observed. You'd see smaller flowers, asynchronous development of the male and female structures within the flower. And we'll show you some examples of that here soon. Failure of the anthers to release pollen where they would not dehiss or that pollen would not be released from the anther sacs. And then you also saw a very pronounced elongation of the stigma. Uh, so you saw a physical separation between the pollen, the anther sacs, and the stigma where that pollen needed to land. And we'll show you some pictures of that here in just a minute. So we characterize heat stress by looking at level one and level two uh, uh, crop canopy temperatures. Um, so we look at anything above 82.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but below 86, we characterize that as level one heat stress. Level two heat stress is anything greater than 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is calculated based upon air temperature, relative humidity, vapor pressure deficit. And all of this information is on the ASMET website. So you can track and follow these level one and level two heat stress days throughout the season. And I'll show you some examples of that data here in just a minute. So again, what we wanted to do was develop a protocol that we could use in field to measure and determine a specific variety's ability to tolerate heat stress, and then correlate those observations to obviously meaningful outcomes such as seed set, 
seed production, fruit retention, and ultimately yield. So that we could come in with a variety, say a new variety comes in, we could do some evaluations to determine whether or not it has good heat tolerance. So this was a project we started in 2019. And because we started that project in 2019, we, uh, it was interesting, 2019 was probably one of the coolest years in terms of heat stress that we've had in quite a few years. Well, if, if anything, 2020 is just quite the opposite of 2019. I'll show you some figures here in a minute. But we were looking at uh, flower and fruit production, looking at pollen dehiscence, flower morphology, looking at abortion and cavitation of, of small bowls uh, through plant mapping. And then we're also looking at the incidence of abnormal or asymmetrical bowls. And then this year we instituted our flower tagging program where we go in and we actually tag the flowers that we evaluate and see how those flowers develop uh, into, into bowls, if they're retained, and then also whether or not they're symmetrical bowls. And then we also collect data at the end of the season where we're looking at seed count, the number of seeds per bowl. Uh, we're also looking at seed size, which is grams per 100 seed, and then obviously lint yield. We've got what we consider to be fairly heat tolerant varieties in there as our commercial controls. We have 1044, which is an old variety from Delta Pine and Delta Pine 1549, which have traditionally shown pretty good levels of heat tolerance. We have an additional 39 entries, actually 37 entries, plus the two controls. We have a total of 39 entries in our trial this year at, uh, at the Maricopa Ag Center. And these are the same entries that we have in our advanced strains testing program. So let me just show you, this is, this is crop canopy temperature on the y-axis uh, in degrees Fahrenheit. And then on the x-axis is time. Uh, this bottom threshold is the level one uh, heat stress uh, threshold. And then the red line at 86 degrees is the level two heat stress. So I've got plotted it on here, 2018 and 2019. Uh, we know really that level two does not have significant impacts on crop development excuse me, level one, but when we hit level two, that's the, really the days that we're interested in looking at. And so you can see in 2018, we had several days here, this blue line where we we're above the level two heat stress threshold um, and, and actually had quite a few days. In 2019, we had, a, we had some scattered days, uh, but you can see here all throughout the end of July and the majority of August, we did not have any level two heat stress days. And that was during that period of, of peak bloom. So another comment is it doesn't matter when that heat stress comes in and what the developmental stage of the crop is. And we know that as, as that crop nears peak bloom, the impacts of level two heat stress has a much more pronounced effect on the crop and on the fruiting forms. Uh, this is what 2019 looked like in the, in the green line. And you can see that we had significant levels uh, numbers of days of level two heat stress here early in the season, beginning in late June. Uh, and then starting again here, well, late June through the middle part of July, we had a little bit of a reprieve. And then the latter part of July had another several, uh, a week, a little over a week of level two heat stress. And then the latter part of July through the middle part of August, we had quite a few days of, of level two heat stress. So that's a figure just showing just uh, 2020, the level two heat stress. So we had significant time periods, consecutive days where crop canopy temperatures at the Maricopa Ag Center were above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I know this is a busy graph, but I wanna, I wanna illustrate a couple of things here. This is air temperature as a function of day of year. And I've got on here, these, these uh, bars are the maximum and the minimum air temperature with the yellow dot in the middle of that bar being the average. And then down here along the bottom, I've got plotted the days where we had level one heat stress, which are the yellow dots and the red dots that are level two heat stress. So this is for 2019. And you'll see that these level two heat stress days really correspond to when we had these high nighttime temperatures. And so really what's driving the level two heat stress is the higher nighttime temperatures. You can see when we get above 80 degrees, and in that range of 85 is really where we begin to see the level two heat stress. Now, if you look at 2020, you can see that from the 1st of July through about the middle of September, very first week of September, I guess, 
just about every day was a level one heat stress. You can see here uh, from these red dots, which correspond to level two heat stress days, we had quite a few more in 2020. In fact, from, from the 1st of July through the 1st of September, about 50% of the days were level two heat stress days at the Maricopa Ag Center. So I just wanted to show you the correlation between level two heat stress and really that nighttime air temperature is really what's triggering that. So what we're doing is we're looking at flower development. Uh, we're rating flowers at several times during the season to see how these flowers develop as a function of heat stress or canopy temperature. So we're looking at flower morphology, which is the separation of the stigma and the style from the anther sacs. So this, we're rating them one through five. Uh, this would be a two where you can see that the stigma and the style are fairly close together. Uh, the, the stigma, excuse me, and the anther sacs are fairly close together. And as we progress out here to a number five, you can see the difference in the separation, the physical separation between the, the stigma and the pollen sacs. We're also doing pollen dehiscence ratings. Um, this would be a zero. And you, if you look at these anther sacs, you can see where you've got the, the pollen dehissing. You see these little grains of pollen on the outside of these anther sacs. Uh, this would be a zero with no pollen. Um, here we have a, a, what we've characterized as a three and then one that's a full pollen. And I want to just show you some pictures from this year. Uh, these are actual pictures that we took this year in the field 2020. Um, this is what we would consider to be a three or a four pollen, almost a perfect flower, a one in terms of its, uh, its um, distance between the, the stigma and the anther sacs, very well developed flower, uh, perfect flower. Uh, this is one that we tagged. Again, you can see on the anther sacs, uh, all the pollen that's being shed on that flower. This is one that we would tag and then we'd come back in two weeks and look at the fate of that pruning form uh, two weeks post, post fresh bloom. And that, those were flowers that we were seeing really almost through the end of July. We saw very good pollination, very good bowl set. But then uh, in mid-July, we really started seeing that heat stress come in. And, and as it got closer to peak bloom, uh, really kind of the wheels started falling off the bus. And we began to see flowers developing similar to what you see in this picture. So dramatic elongation of the stigma and the style, anther sacs, not dehissing pollen, very short uh, filaments, which are the stalk that connects the anther sac to the flower. Uh, they don't develop, they don't extend properly, and you get very poor pollen shed. Here's another example of a typical flower that we were seeing during the peak of the heat stress days that we experienced in 2020. And what really what that results in primarily is cavitation of small one to three day old bowls. And this was a very common occurrence that we saw in our varieties this year. Uh, you'd see sections of the fruit set, layers, so to speak, of that fruit set that was exposed to that heat stress uh, where those small bowls would cavitate. And then the bowls that did remain on the plant, oftentimes uh, you had poor pollination, you had uh, poor seed set, and so you'd end up with asymmetrical or misshapen bowls where you have these locks that you can see on the left-hand side of this picture that did not develop seed, and then you have pollination in these, and so you get this, this uh, beaked bowl um, phenomenon that you see in the field as a result of the heat stress. And then once those bowls begin to open, this is the kind of the, the result that you see. Uh, now, there are other things that can cause this other than heat stress. Insect damage uh, can cause some of these, some of this similar type of phenomenon. Uh, but in this case, we're dealing with, we, we know this is a function of heat stress, where you get lots that don't develop or the seeds that develop are very small, very few seeds, and you end up with cotton that doesn't fluff out as that bowl opens. It's very difficult to pick. You get a lot of tagging on the bowls. Um, it's just a, a bad situation. So I'm just going to show you one data slide from this year. Uh, we're still in the process. We still have a lot of data to collect out of these plots here towards the end of the season in terms of our, our harvest data and our seed data. But this, this figure right here, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this one because it's a, it's a little bit complicated. This 
upper graph is the flower morphology and the pollen dehiscence data as a function of time on the four sample dates that we have. So the red bar is flower morphology. So remember, as the lower the number in flower morphology, the better the flower. Uh, so we, we were looking at number two on average across these 40 different varieties. The 30th of July, we're up around three and a half, which was our worst date. And then they kind of dropped back down here where we saw better flower development in these later dates. Now, this blue line represents pollen dehiscence. So again, the higher the number, the more pollen that was being dehissed by that flower. So early in July, uh, we had very good pollen dehiscence, you know, fours, uh, very common. The, the, entire, the entire flower was dehissing pollen. But you can see on that 30th of July, we had very, very little pollen set whatsoever. Uh, come back here on the 12th of August, begins to pick back up into the 27th of August. But this was probably our worst date for evaluating was that 30th of July. Uh, and if you look at as we tag these blossoms and follow them through to uh, through to maturity again so this this date here on the 16th of July we evaluated on the 30th of July so the result of the 16th of July tags we had 80 percent the red bar is indicating the number of flowers that were retained 80 percent of those flowers were retained and uh, the blue line represents the asymmetry or the percent of the bowls that were asymmetrical so we had about 20 to 25% asymmetrical bowls. If you look at the flowers that were tagged on the 30th of June that had very low pollen and very malformed uh, reproductive parts, you can see that we only held about 3% of those flowers, 97% of those flowers aborted. And those that did hold, 80% of them were misshapen. Now we get back down to the 27th of August, we're still only retaining, this was evaluated on the 27th of flowers that were tagged on the 12th, still only retaining about 35%, so still shedding quite a few bowls. And then here on the 10th, flowers that were tagged on the 27th, again, about 35% of those bowls were retained. Uh, the asymmetry dropped back down to what we saw pre, uh, really uh, before we saw the significant heat stress, but we were still in that range of 20 to 25. So what, we're, what we'll do as we go in, we'll sample these, these plots, we'll collect uh, bowl samples to be able to look at bowl size, to be able to look at seed per bowl, and hopefully correlate some of that data uh, with, with seed cotton yield. So I'm just going to show just a couple of slides here from 2019. Uh, and, and this is data that, that comes from that year. We don't have it collected yet for 2020. But we will be looking at a final plant map We'll look at percent fruit retention, we'll look at height to node ratio, number of main stem nodes, and look at total percent asymmetrical bowls on that plant. So that, that's data from last year. You can see kind of the range. We had a range last year of 20, a mean of 29% asymmetrical bowls, but a range from 15% to 67% among the varieties that we tested last year. Uh, and then you can also see our percent fruit retention uh, minimum that should be switched around. Maximum was 65%, minimum was 24% in those varieties. So we'll collect all that data for 2020. Also looking at seed and yield data, percent length, seed index, number of grams per 100 seed, seed weight per bowl, number of seed per bowl, and then obviously seed cotton yield. Unfortunately, in 2019, none of these values that we collected in terms of seed data really correlated very strongly to yield. So we're hoping because of 2019, the, the lack of heat stress that we had and the timing of that heat stress when it came in, the crop was not um, near peak bloom or you know in full bloom, it was early and then came in late. We hope that in 2020, we'll see a better relationship between some of these seed values that we collect and seed cotton yield. Uh, just a couple of figures here. This is again from 2019. This is a flower morphology correlation between seed cotton yield and flower morphology rating. We did get a, a correlation coefficient of a negative 0.4. So that means that as, as the separation between the stigma and the, the pollen uh, becomes greater, 
yield in general declines, which is what we would expect. And this is for 26th August date that we evaluated. So we are seeing some correlation between seed cotton yield and some of the flower parameters that we're measuring. Uh, this is pollen dehiscence, a positive relationship. Our, our Pearson's R correlation of 0.5. This is on the 31st of July, whereas pollen dehiscence goes up, seed cotton yield goes up, uh, which is what obviously what we would expect. And then percent asymmetrical bowls, really no relationship there between asymmetrical bowls and yield in 2019. Uh, we hope that we see some better relationships in 2020 with the increased heat stress. So again, just in conclusion, uh, we do see quite a bit of variability among the varieties in their response to these levels of heat stress, both flower morphology, pollen dehiscence, seed attributes, final plant map, and yield. But in 19, we had poor to moderate correlation among these measured values, um, which, you know, as you might expect, tells us that there's more than just heat stress that's controlling yield or heat tolerance that's controlling yield. There's other factors in there. Uh, but we're trying to we're trying to get at some of these finer points in terms of, of uh, uh, response to heat stress. And again, 2019 was a relatively low heat stress year. We really didn't have extended periods of level two. So we're going to continue this work in 2020. Uh, we'll have hope to have a publication out this year documenting the 2019 and 2020 results uh, and be able to, to uh, again, develop this technique, an infield technique that we can use to evaluate some of the stress effects on cotton. So with that, I'm an, I am done. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any questions. Oh, thank you, Randy. I, I, I think we have a couple of questions here, if you can see them in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, first question was, uh, does the L1 and L2 heat stress levels also apply to other crops? Well, that's a really good question. Um, all of this crop canopy temperature data that we're using has been developed specifically for cotton. Now, I would, I would suspect that there are going to be levels of crop canopy temperature, as with any, you know, any plant, once that temperature, internal temperature of that plant leaf uh, begins to get to a certain level, things begin to shut down. So I, I would expect that there are thresholds developed or there are thresholds, whether or not they're developed or known for other crops. Um, I'm sure they, that they are out there. Uh, it would just be a matter of determining what they are and how the crop responds to those different crop canopy temperatures. So the short answer is yes, I'm sure there are. Whether or not, I, I don't have any information whether or not they've been documented. Is, does that answer the question, Rusty? Okay, okay. Uh, we have another question, Randy, uh, at, at the end of the chat box, uh, Carl, and he's asking, how long in days does the uh, deleterious effect of L2 heat stress continue to affect or affect the cotton plant? Yeah. If uh, in the unlikely instant of one day of L2 stress uh, preceded and followed by no stress, what kind of flower def deformation, defamation, and cavitation could be expected? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and that's, that's a question that we're, we're trying to get at. If you look in the literature, there's pretty good evidence that the heat stress effects itself are fairly short-lived. That, um, that once that heat stress event ends, that you know, flowers that are developing uh, under those non-stress conditions, and it could be even as much as a day difference, are not going to be affected. Uh, now, the other thing that I, that I will say is that there is a delay between when those heat stress events occur and when you see the effects of it. And, and you'll see different values in the literature. Some people will say it's as, it's as little as 10 days. Uh, I've seen estimates of as many as 18 days that it's that, it's that it takes. So it's the, the fruiting forms in those immature stages that are really being affected by the heat stress. Now we're measuring that heat stress as it comes to a flower. But, but it's, uh, there's a delay in, the, in when you see that 
in the field because we're obviously you really can't measure the heat stress in a developing square. Uh, but you do see that the, the, the results of that heat stress in the flower once that flower develops. So there is a delay from when that heat stress occurs and when you begin to see it in the field. But in terms of when that heat stress ends, uh, the effects are gone and, and you, don't see, you don't see the effects linger from that heat stress event. I, I hope that answers the question if I haven't muddied it even worse. Does that answer the question? Okay, follow up question from uh, Rusty here, Randy. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are the impacts of high nighttime temperature uh, separate from daytime temperatures? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's a very good correlation between level two heat stress and overnight temperature. Um, and, and every time we see level two heat stress day, it's when that overnight temperature is above 80 to 85, air temperature is above 80 to 85 degrees. So, so I'm, I'm sure the daytime temperature has an influence. Uh, there's got, we haven't really looked at the correlation between daytime temperature and level two heat stress, but I'm sure that there's a correlation, obviously, as it gets hotter during the day, more than likely it's gonna be hotter overnight. But, but really what oftentimes keeps that temperature elevated overnight is, is humidity. And that's why the crop canopy temperature takes into account vapor pressure deficit uh, for calculating that crop canopy temperature. So as humidity levels increase, uh, nighttime temperatures tend to increase and that's when we see the level two heat stress phase. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further question for Andy before he leave? If I could just say one more thing, I'm and I, I go ahead, then. This this last slide. We are going to continue to do this. Uh, we we have good support, and I want to mention that that support is coming from the participating seed companies. Uh, they've come together, and we've presented this to them: uh, Bayer, BASF, Corteva, and Americop, and they all have have come up with funding to support this. We appreciate their efforts. And as I mentioned before, Karen, and, and there are probably other uh, agronomists that are doing some of the same work, but I am familiar with what Karen's doing. I think she's gonna be talking about a little bit today with America. Uh, but I'm also doing some work with Corteva, evaluating some of their lines for heat tolerance. So there's a lot of work going on and there's a lot of interest across the belt in heat tolerance, even though they might not have some of the same temperature regimes that we have. But heat tolerance can also